in some ways, I, I sort of feel a little queasy about being called a critic. I think of myself more as a, as a reporter slash reviewer. I mean, I, I say, I've seen myself more as a bridge between the art form and an audience that potentially might be interested in it that don't necessarily go to it. So it's very important to write in a way that makes it engaging and uh, maybe even persuade people they should take a chance on it. And I write for the audience. I write for the, an audience of readers, not for choreographers, not for dancers. I don't think dancers and choreographers should have anything to do with reading reviews or features about them. Just ignore it all. It's just noise. Just focus on your art. I mean, the kind of stuff that I write is for an audience of readers. I was working on my PhD at McMaster and um, there was a woman called Natalie Donnett Emmett who ran the sort of quasi-theater program and it was a small theater at Mac and she started bringing in some dance groups and um, somehow uh, because I knew Natalie she said oh you should come and see this blah 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 whatever and I had seen ballet in England growing up uh, before I came to Canada uh, but I was just smitten and so I just started going to dance voraciously and because of the timing and because I was already writing about the performing arts for like college papers and things um, I started writing about dance totally incompetently uh, because I hardly knew a damn thing um, and um, I was lucky in my timing because this was the dance boom and it was the beginning of a, a rapid expansion of uh, professional dance in Canada. I suddenly found people saying, oh, could you write about this? Could you write about that? Because nobody else beyond the you know, newspaper critics was really doing it. Um, and um, so it sort of snowballed. And uh, Arnold Edinburgh, who used to run a magazine called Performing Arts in Canada, asked me to be dance editor, so I managed to get more dance articles into Performing Arts in Canada magazine. And then, out of the blue, um, a man called Grant Stratty, who is iconic in Canadian dance, um, called me up and said, um, we'd like you to be the next editor of um, Dance in Canada magazine because Susan Cohen, the, the founding editor, was moving on. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. Me? Why me? You know, unless it was 1977. And you, Grant's the kind of person that, that if once he's determined something's going to be a certain way. So he just wore me down. In fact, he took me out to dinner, um, plied me with wine after a martini to start, of course, being Grant. And by the end of the meal, I said, OK. <laughs> Why I'm very grateful for having had the opportunity to edit Dance in Canada magazine with Holly Small was um, it forced me to open my eyes to the fact that there is no real center. I mean, there are centers. There's Montreal, there's Toronto, there's Winnipeg, uh, there's Vancouver. So quickly, I sort of got the sense that you can't see things from a Toronto-centric point of view because people in Vancouver have a very different image of things. Uh, people in Montreal have a very different, uh, well, even aesthetic. Um, and so you're dealing with a, a sort of, a, not a kaleidoscope, but a, but a very varied national dance scene. I got to interview some amazing luminaries of dance at a very early age. I look back and I pinch myself and I think, did this really happen? You know, Robert Joffrey and Alvin Ailey and Frederick Ashton. and uh, It was extraordinary. Um, and so I began to cut my teeth in broadcasting and then did more and more on a freelance basis for CBC until I decided that's the way I'm going and joined CBC full time, which was good because it gave me the sort of stable salary you need if you're going to be a dance critic. Personally, I was able to do quite a few dance documentaries or dance-oriented programming. Um, so I was sort of the, the go-to dance guy in, in the team 
although I was doing lots of other, you know, arts programming as well. And then um, I moved to, as senior producer, to a show called The Arts Report, which was a daily kind of arts news service that went on both networks, coast to coast. Um, and then I sort of hosted that for seven years um, until I quit the CBC to write a book about Arnold Spore, which took two years of my life. A sort of a pleasant nightmare, shall we say. And, um, and then uh, from then on remained totally freelance. I carried on doing stuff for CBC, I think, until about 2010, uh, when they decided that uh, dance was too elitist for, for them. Some creative artists just want to go always moving forward and never look at the past. In dance, however, historically, there have been a number of works uh, that should somehow become part of the canon, uh, even to the extent that they may be danced by other companies, not the company that created them, because the company that created them may have, in fact, ev evaporated. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had just a company that would collect and preserve a company that could collect, preserve, perform, and tour some of these masterworks um, from our contemporary dance heritage, which still deserve to be seen. I'm just glad that my time came along at a period when dance was really, really thriving. I can remember people scalping, scalping tickets to see Karen Kane and Frank Augustine dance Giselle at the Sony Center. Oh, well, it was then the O'Keeffe Center. Scalping tickets. Can you imagine? And a throng of people at the stage door waiting for autographs. And you don't find that anymore. It's a different world. <laughs>